The Jews are survivors. Time and again, various nations and movements have fought to try to destroy them. Even we've heard this week of attacks that have come on Israel. Since the time that God set his favor on Abraham and and on his descendants so that they would carry the line of Messiah, God has preserved the Jews, often from punishments that they brought on themselves because of their disobedience, but he has preserved them. God protected Abraham from hostile kings. God preserved Jacob from the anger of his brother Esau when Jacob had cheated Esau out of his birthright. God arranged for Jacob's son Joseph to be sold into slavery in Egypt in order to protect Israel from the famine that came later. And then he raised up Moses to deliver them out of slavery to a king that did not know Joseph anymore. God established King David from the line of Judah to place Israel as as a dominant power in the Middle East. Time and again, God gave Israel victories over kingdoms and over attackers attackers that are greater than them in, in an earthly understanding. And often that came in unusual ways. You can look in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 that, that talks about how King Jehoshaphat prayed to God because Jerusalem was under attack by a combined group by Ammon and, and Moab and Mount Seir. And God caused Israel's enemies to rise up and destroy one another rather than Jerusalem. When the Assyrian king Sennacherib came, rallied his forces against Jerusalem during King Hezekiah's reign, God promised Hezekiah concerning Sennacherib in Isaiah chapter 37, verse 34 and 35. He said, by the way that he came, by the same he will return. And he will not come to this city, declares the Lord, for all. I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. And the angel of Yahweh destroyed 185,000 Assyrians in one night without Judah lifting a finger. God's care for Israel is a testimony for his, his care for his name's sake and a testimony to him keeping his promises. It's not for some greatness that's intrinsic to Israel. At one point, the line of David, through whom Israel's deliverer was to come, the Messiah, had dwindled down to a single son of King Ahaziah in David's line. After his own mother tried to kill all of Ahaziah's sons, after he had died himself. But his son Joash was hidden by his nurse from his grandmother, and that kept the line of David going, and therefore the line of Messiah. God preserved a remnant of Israel during exile in Assyria and Babylon, in which the elite sons of Israel and Judah were carried to a foreign land. And then he brought them back to Jerusalem. In recent times, Jews have survived ongoing anti-Semitism, including the Holocaust of Nazi Germany in the early 20th century. And it's difficult to explain how the Jews have survived apart from God's providential program. It defies human explanation that the Jews have 
have maintained their identity as a people even, with their unique customs as they're scattered around the planet, even as they do now since 1948 have, have a place of their own again. Two, two millennia they've been scattered around the world. And they're still scattered. But God has preserved Israel as a nation against the odds at many times and in many ways. Well, there was another such preservation that occurred during the time between the Old and New Testaments. It occurred in, in the time after 167 B.C. when Syria, under the leadership of Antiochus Epiphanes, overtook Jerusalem and occupied it for three years. Now, Antiochus Epiphanes declared himself to be God, and yet he worshipped other gods, and he desecrated the temple in Jerusalem by sacrificing pigs on the altar. Now, after about three years of occupation, the, the Jewish general, Judas Maccabeus, who was known as Judas the Hammer, retook Jerusalem, and it was in a great military victory that was against the odds. The odds weighed against them, and he purified the temple and rededicated the temple after its desecration by Antiochus Epiphanes. And that rededication happened in the Jewish month of Kislev. That's around December on our calendar. Now, legend has it, and you may have heard this legend, that when the ceremonial candelabra was relit, there was enough oil for one day. One day's supply of oil, and yet it burned for eight days. And, and it's that became a, a festival later on. Judas Maccabeus ordered that there would be an annual celebration, and it was similar to the Feast of Booths that we've talked about in recent weeks, beginning the day that the cleansing occurred. And this is the historical basis for the celebration that's known today as Hanukkah. In Jesus' day, it was known as the Feast of Dedication. Underlying God's providence toward Israel is the powerful reality of the one who is behind it all and the promised plan of Almighty God to reestablish the kingdom of Israel under a mighty deliverer, the Messiah. In the first century A.D., when Jesus walked this planet, there was this heightened sense of anticipation of Messiah, especially around these festivals. Israel's deliverer was coming. They knew that. They believed that. And the Jews expected Messiah, the Christ. They expected that he would be like a conquering general, like Judas Maccabeus. And that is the setting. That's the background for this section of Scripture. And we'll see in John 10, 22, John introduced the following dialogue by telling us at the time, at that time, the feast of the dedication took place at Jerusalem. The feast of dedication. Again, that's the very feast that was commemorated, that commemorated the rededication of the temple after Judas Maccabeus had retaken it with a great military victory. Again, the, the Jews were thinking about God's promised deliverer around that time. That is the setting for this conversation that we see in the rest of this chapter of John 10. Jesus, who is God's deliverer, God's Messiah, His anointed one, has come. And we'll see in John 10, verse 22 through 30, we'll see first this deliverer disdained. And then we'll see, secondly, this deliverer explained. We see the deliverer disdained in verses 22 through 23, and we'll break this disdain into the complaint of the Jews in verses 22 through 24, and then the unbelief of the Jews in verse 25 and 26. 
Now, the setting for the complaint of the Jews is in the first couple verses. As we started, at that time, the Feast of the Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter. And Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. This time reference, this is the first time indicator that we've had since John chapter 7, verse 2, that mentioned the Feast of the Booths. Now, the Feast of Booths occurred in October, and this Feast of Dedication occurred in December. So, a couple months has gone by, and it was the time of the celebration of the dedication of the temple, as I explained. And Jesus had remained in or around Jerusalem for this time, so far as we know, and it was winter, John tells us. Now, the mention of winter does explain in part why Jesus was walking under this covered porch, the portico of Solomon, which was inside the outer wall of the temple grounds area. It was cold and rainy during the winter, and that was a good place to walk. However, as we've seen so many times, John rarely inserts his comments just to explain the history. He likes to use the setting in a significant way, and it's reasonable to suppose that winter may be symbolic of the cold reception that this deliverer, Jesus, would get from the Jews. It's like in the movies. You notice how often at a funeral, it's raining. Now, if it rains at a wedding in a movie, you know trouble is coming. In this story, there's trouble coming. Jesus was walking under this porch structure when the Jews approached him, and, and their complaint is in verse 24. It says, Then the Jews gathered around him and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Now, this word for, for gather means to surround, to encircle, and it often suggested hostile intent. Not always. But we have reason, as we'll see, to think that these Jews are hostile. We've seen that before, and, and their manner of questioning Jesus is hostile. And then, well, later on, they're going to pick up stones to stone him. That's pretty hostile. The Jews surrounded Jesus, and they complained they complain to him that he's been unclear. Tell us plainly, how long will you keep us in suspense? That's the... The translation, that's a good way of rendering this. The, the question more literally is, until when will you lift up our soul? Until, until when will you take away our life? The, the Jews are irritated with Jesus. They see him as a threat to their leadership. And well, he is. And they may also be concerned that the, that the Romans could take away some of their freedoms and privileges because of his activities in the world. And so they demanded of Jesus, if you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Just, just come out and tell us. Now, the Christ is the Messiah. He's, he's the anointed one, the deliverer of Israel. And the, and the Jews are thinking about a political, military-style delivery, like that of Judas Maccabeus. That's on their minds. And that's probably why Jesus has not said outright, I am the Christ. He knew he would be misunderstood, and he knew also that he wouldn't be believed. He would be considered, in fact, a blasphemer. When Jesus was before the Sanhedrin, as recorded in Luke chapter 22, verse 67, the Sanhedrin said to him, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, if I tell you, you will not believe. That was a trap. And this is a trap. The Jews were looking for Jesus to make a claim that they can call blasphemy so that they can put him to death. It's a setup. Their complaint is a setup. and They're not honest seekers. They're not 
hoping Jesus is the Messiah, maybe this is the one. They're looking for reasons to accuse him. And you'll encounter people like this in, in your witnessing efforts that are, that are not honest seekers, people who complain about God's injustice in the Bible or, or something that they consider a contradiction in Scripture. But, but too often, once you answer one concern, they have another to replace it. And another, and another, and so on. And that's a, an indication that they're not honest seekers. They just are going to keep complaining about what they don't like. And then the complaint of the Jews here is a ruse. Jesus recognized that. And then in verse 25 and 26, we see the unbelief of the Jews. Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. Jesus claimed that he had told them the answer to their question. Now, when and how did he tell them? Well, really, he's been telling them all along in some ways. He's talking about the claims that, that he made about his relationship to his father for several chapters. And, of course, there's the signs that he did that point to who he is, that testify of him. Now, now, Jesus did tell the Samaritan woman plainly when she said, I know that Messiah is coming. Jesus said to her in chapter 4, 26, I who speak to you am he. But that was a, that was a private gathering. That wasn't public. He had riled up the Jews in chapter 5, verse 17, after he had told the lame man to pick up his mat and walk. And and the Jews complained that he did that on the Sabbath. And, and he said, my father is working until now. And I am working. The Jews rightly interpreted this as a claim of equality with God. Jesus claimed to pre-exist Abraham in chapter 8, verse 58. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. And that prompted the Jews to pick up stones to stone him because they knew what he meant. They understood the thrust of what Jesus was claiming about himself. So when Jesus told them here that I told you and you do not believe, the implication is that he has been claiming to be the Christ. The Messiah. This clearly, to say, I told you and you do not believe, is clearly not a denial that he is the Christ. The problem was not that he was unclear. The problem was with their unbelief, with their faith, their lack of it. I told you and you do not believe. Further, he said, the works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. The works testify that Jesus has been sent by the Father with the authority to speak for the Father. John 5, 36 says, But the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John, for the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do, testify about me that the Father has sent me. And so the works that Jesus did showed his unity with the Father. He did the works in his Father's name for the reputation of his Father. The works prove that he was sent by the Father. In fact, Jesus' works are the Father's works including the, the work of deliverance that the Jews longed for. That work was a work of the Father. But it did not come in the, in the way that they expected or desired. They wanted political deliverance. 
Jesus brought spiritual redemption. Payment for sin. Reconciliation with God the Father. But the Jews did not believe. And the reason that they did not believe, Jesus said, is, you are not of my sheep. Or as he put it in chapter 8, 47, because you are not of God. To be Jesus' sheep, to be of God, requires God to intervene on your behalf. John 3, 3 says, Jesus answered and said to him, this is to Nicodemus, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again or born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, your role in being born is purely passive. Much more your conception. You have nothing to do with it. And that is the point. That's exactly Jesus' point. Or again, in chapter 6, verse 44 and 45, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Jesus is the deliverer sent from God to save people from their sin. Their sin that causes spiritual death. The Jews disdained their deliverer. They despised him. They complained that he was unclear. And they refused to believe even when he was clear even when they indicated that they understood exactly what he was saying by their response. They saw what they wanted to see and heard what they wanted to hear. Mark Twain reportedly said, It ain't the parts of the Bible that I can't understand that bother me. It's the parts I do understand. That's an honest admission. There are those who claim to not understand the Bible, who who claim that God has not been clear, and they use that as an excuse for unbelief and for sin. The gospel of Jesus Christ is very clear. God is the creator and owner of everything. Everything and he has a right to expect obedience and he has a right to judge disobedience. Every human being is born with a sin nature that they cannot fix, they are opposed to God, in rebellion against God. But God sent his Son, Jesus Christ, as the perfect representative of mankind and as the perfect sacrifice in the place of mankind so that whoever repents and places trust in Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sin has eternal life. It's a clear message. You either believe and receive life or you refuse to believe and you'll pay the penalty of your sin by yourself. Don't disdain your deliverer like these Jews did. Rather, trust and obey him. Well, this passage shows the deliverer disdained and it shows the deliverer explained. In verse 27 through 30, Jesus summarized who he is and why he has come. We'll see that the deliverer is explained as the one who has knowledge, power, and a plan. And he holds this knowledge, power, and plan in union with the Heavenly Father. And our outline will be, the Deliverer knows his sheep in verse 27. He holds his sheep in verse 28, and he reassures his sheep in verse 29 and 30. 
First, in contrast to those who disdain the deliverer, God knows the sheep, and his sheep know him. Verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. We recognize this from earlier in the chapter, in verse 4, when, when he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. Jesus, the, the good shepherd, calls to his sheep. He knows those who are his, and they know his voice, and they follow The security of the sheep is that they are known by the shepherd. And the proof that they are known by the shepherd is that they know him and follow him. Verse 14 through 16 said, I am the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me, even as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep, which are not of this fold, I must bring them also. And they will hear my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd. When Jesus said in verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, there's something that we don't notice here in the English. The word for sheep is a plural neuter word in Greek. It's neither masculine nor feminine. Now, usually in the Greek, a plural neuter subject, and animals would be neuter, a plural neuter subject takes a singular verb. That would be like us saying, the sheep's hears. But here we we have a a plural verb. And this, this just stresses, it sounds a little more natural for us in English, but this was different for, for, for Greek. And, and that difference stresses that each individual one of Jesus' sheep hears and follows. I'm looking at my daughter because we talked about sheeps. She challenged me to say sheeps up here. And I said, actually, I was going to say sheeps. It's distinct here because it's a change of the usual grammar. It's very personal. Jesus knows and calls his individual sheep or sheeps. Now, Jesus' knowledge of his individual sheep also means that he knows when some, like these Jews, are not his sheep. There's a strange tension here which Scripture doesn't try to resolve for us. The Jews willfully rejected Jesus. They were responsible for rejecting Jesus. They were responsible for their complaint and for their unbelief. That's human responsibility. But from the perspective of God's sovereignty, they were not his sheep. Jesus knew that. Just as he knew about Judas, one of the twelve. And the betrayal of Jesus that was coming, and it's portrayed in Luke 22, 22, it says, For indeed the Son of Man is going as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. In other words, in God's sovereign plan, Judas would betray Jesus. And Judas is responsible for betraying Jesus. He was not dragged kicking and screaming. To betray Jesus. He did it willingly and from a heart of hatred for Jesus. God's sovereignty it's, it doesn't displace man's responsibility. That's, that's a puzzle for us. God is sovereign. Man is responsible. And in order not to go beyond Scripture, I have to leave it at that. The deliverer, Jesus, knows his sheep. He calls them and they come. But the deliverer not only knows his sheep, secondly, he holds his sheep. He preserves them, verse 28. And I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Jesus has life in himself. That's why he can give life. 
1 John 5, 11 says, And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. And that life is an indestructible life. That's why Jesus' sheep never perish. As 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 to 5 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Eternal life is a repaired relationship with God now and the promise of an eternity with Him in the future. It's secure. It's reserved in heaven for you. It is imperishable. It cannot be taken away. Jesus said, they will never perish. John 3.16, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Moreover, he says, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. By the way, this word for snatch, it's the same word that you find in 1 Thessalonians 4.17 that describes what happens to the church members who are alive at the rapture. They will be snatched up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That's a snatching you want to happen to you. Jesus is talking about a snatching you wouldn't want to happen to you. It's the power of Jesus Christ that he holds his sheep. John 6, 39 says, And this is the will of him who sent me, that of everything he has given me, I will lose nothing, but will raise it up on the last day. Psalm, chapter, Psalm 95, verse 7, calls us the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. He will hold you fast. He knows his sheep, and he holds his sheep. Well, also in John 10, verse 29 through 30, he reassures his sheep. He he reassures his sheep based on the plan that he shares with his father. His knowing the sheep and his holding the sheep are works that Jesus does in common with his heavenly father. My father, he says, who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. No one will snatch them out of Jesus' hand because no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. They are the same hand. First, the Father gave the Son his sheep to know and to hold. Second, there is no one greater than God the Father who could snatch the sheep from his hand. It's impossible. And Jesus himself is the hand of the Father. That's a great reassurance in itself. But Jesus went beyond even that. And he he says in verse 30, I and the Father are one. Now here, Jesus answered any suspicion that Jesus promised more than he can deliver. He did not overpromise. This verse has been used as evidence of Jesus' deity, and and rightly so. But but it's not quite as simple as you may think. It was used quite a bit in the 4th and 5th century against the Arians, the Arians who, who deny that Jesus is God. They this verse was used to prove that Jesus claimed to be God. Modern-day Arians, such as those who call themselves Jehovah's Witnesses, say, no, Jesus is not claiming to be God here. He's claiming a a common spirit, a, a will 
submitted to God, like, like when we as church members say we are one. It's, it's that the sense. We're, we're one in a certain sense. Well, is that the unity that Jesus is speaking of here? Well, we have to admit that Jesus' words about unity with the Father are not a decisive claim of deity by themselves. Consider Jesus' words in John 17, verse 22. He said, The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. Jesus is not saying that believers share being in the, in the same way as the Father and Son share being. It's, it's more of a unity of purpose and in shared identity in Christ. Maybe that's the type of unity that, that Jesus is speaking of with the Father here. Even the immediate context describes Jesus' unity of purpose with the Father. That's the purpose of securing his sheep. It's the will of the Father that the sheep are protected. It's likewise the will of the Son. They they share that unity of purpose, the unity of will. However, that unity of will and that unity of purpose is a unity of the divine will and the divine purpose. It's more than just Jesus agreeing with the Father. Jesus and the Father share the divine will. And further, the context of the entire discussion going all the way back to, to Jesus' claim to be doing His Father's work in 519... And the the following discussion that that goes on where Jesus describes the Father and the Son's unity of power and purpose there that gave the basis of the Jews wanting to kill him, that, that also is context for this saying of Jesus that I and the Father are one. Moreover, John 1 1 claims. In the beginning was the Word, and we we know, we learn that the Word is Jesus Christ. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word, Jesus, is distinct from God, and yet He is God. Also in John 1.3, Jesus is is the creator of all. And in John 1.4, he is the source of life. So John 10.30, as important as it is, doesn't make any claim beyond what we saw in the opening verses of this gospel. In John 1, verse 1 through 4. John's entire purpose in writing the gospel is to convince you that Jesus is God. Now, There's an interesting feature in this verse that I want to point out that you can't see in the English. I and the Father are one. There is a plural subject. I and the Father, two. So it's plural. And then there's a plural verb, are, rather than is. We would say he is, but they are. Are is a plural verb, and it's plural in the Greek here as well. But there's a singular, neuter predicate. One. Now, Jesus could have used a masculine form of that verb, of that, rather, that word for one. In that case, it would mean that they are one person. But instead, it means that they are one thing. In other words, they're not one person who, but they are one what. They share essence or being. They are one in being. They are not one in person. They are distinct persons. Unlike the the Unitarian claim that there is one God who appears in three modes, Father, Son, Spirit, This verse does not support that idea at all. It does, however, fit 
very nicely with Trinitarianism. One God in three persons. Returning to, to John 17.22 that we looked at earlier, we, we can also say that, that the manner of oneness of believers with one another is not reciprocal in the same way in which the Son and the Father's manner of unity is. Jesus determines our unity with one another. We, we don't, it doesn't go the other way. Finally, look at the response of the Jews in verse 31. How did they understand Jesus' words? Verse 31, they, the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. They knew what Jesus meant with those words. They knew he was claiming to be God. Just as they did back in John 5.18 when he claimed to be doing God's work. And in chapter 8, 59, when he said that he was born before Abraham was, Jesus was claiming to be equal to God. Jesus' divine nature is what anchors his knowledge of the sheep. He knows those who are his, and that secures his promise in verse 28. I give life to them, eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Jesus has a true human nature so that he could represent you when he died on the cross. Jesus also has a true divine nature. His unity with the Father includes His will. And it also includes His being and His power. Just as He has power to lay down His life and take it up, He also has the power to raise you spiritually with Him. That's why you can trust Jesus' life, death, and and resurrection, that it secures eternal life for you. If you will admit that you are a sinner, unable to save yourself, turn to Him, repent of your sins, and believe that you have life in the Son. Jesus is our deliverer, not just of the Jews. His deliverance of you is secure. You are safe in His hands. The Jews of Jesus' day rejected their deliverer. They disdained him. Now that's not the end of God's work on behalf of the Jews. Paul wrote about the Jews in, in Romans 11, verse 11 through 12. He said, I say then they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by their transgression, the Jews, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Now, if their transgression is riches for the world and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? And then Paul warns us Gentiles against pride in verse 17 and following. But if some of the branches were broken off and you, being a wild olive, were grafted in among them and became partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief, but you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear, for if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Behold then the kindness and severity of God. To those who fell, severity, but to you, God's kindness, if you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. God is still Israel's deliverer. As he was at the beginning, he will not leave them and abandon them. But blessed are you 
who hear Jesus' voice and obey him by believing him. You show that you are his sheep. Jesus knows his sheep. Jesus helps his sheep. And he reassures his sheep because he is God. He has the power of God. Let's pray.